With AI especially, I'm really optimistic. Demand is just off the charts. Uh, you you see the, the popularity of all these AI services now? Uh, AI is overhyped in the short term and probably underestimated over the long term. We're reaching a tipping point on generative AI. AI, ever since its development and when ChatGPT came to the market a few years ago, has raised complex legal issues. The main reason for this is that the millions of works that large language models trained on, many of those works were copyrighted and the training was done without the permission of the copyright owner. This has led to dozens of lawsuits in the US between content owners on one side, and this includes owners of print media, newspapers, uh, books, as well as um, images, sound recordings, and even video recorders. On the other side are those developers of the large language models. So this includes OpenAI, which is faces more lawsuits than anybody else in the space, as well as Anthropic, Perplexity, Stability AI. Also sued are some of the large technology firms, including Meta, Google, and Microsoft. Now, the reason this is as important is because in the US, statutory damages for copyright infringement mean that hundreds of billions, and in some cases, even trillions of dollars in damages are theoretically possible. Now, if damages were to reach anywhere near this amount, that could pose an existential threat for some of the pure play AI technology firms. And this also could be a material risk for the large technology firms that are developing in the space. There are four fair use factors. The first one looks at the purpose and character of the use, and it compares how the defendant, the one accused of copyright infringement, used the work versus how the original content creator used it. And really what they're looking for is whether or not it was a transformative second use or not. Now that's factor one, purpose and character. The second factor looks at the nature of the copyrighted work. And here what we're looking at is sometimes if it's a nonfiction work, that might be entitled to less strong protection than say a nonfiction work. So that's the nature of the copyrighted work, it is a second factor. The third factor looks at the amount used. If there's a smaller, we can call it sampling size use, then that is more likely to be fair use rather than if the whole um, copyrighted work is used. And then the fourth factor, which is a very important factor along with the first factor, looks at the potential market impact of that second use on the market for the original copyrighted work. And now again, this is a very important factor that courts are really looking at very closely with respect to generative AI. Now fair use is a very powerful defense in the US and it's been used most relevantly to the generative AI cases by Google Books. Now about a decade or so ago, Google had the idea that we're going to digitize the world's libraries. And it did so by scanning all the books that a number of institutions in the US, they partnered up, they scanned, they digitized all these books and they made it searchable by Google Books users. Now publishers, did not give permission to this in advance. And in fact, they sued Google and some of the academic institutions for this project. Now the litigation took about a decade from start to finish and ultimately Google did receive fair use protection. And this was a decision by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. However, it, it's broadly considered to be the case that potentially most stretches the fair use doctrine. And I should note that when this was decided, what the court did is it found that the fourth fair use factor, which is a factor that looks at the potential impact on the market, in the case of Google Books, that weighed in favor of Google. The reason for that is that Google did is they directed users. If a user searched for a term, was looking for a book, Google would show them the book that was in, but they would also direct the user to places where they could purchase the book, be it Amazon or some other outlet. Now this ultimately had a positive impact on the market, for the original copyrighted work. This might not be the same when you were looking at generative AI cases. It may have a more detrimental impact on the market. We're gonna have to wait and see how courts are going to look at that. Now, another case that's, that's highly relevant, I think, is a more recent case. It's a 2021 decision by the US Supreme Court involving the artist Annie Warhol, the former musician Prince, and a magazine that wanted to use one of Warhol's altered images of Prince. So this was a photograph that was taken by a photographer 
later altered by Warhol, and a magazine ran with it on the cover. Now the original photographer, sa photographer said, we I did not give license for this to be used. I gave license for it to be used decades ago, but this is a different use. The Supreme Court ultimately agreed and said that yes, what Warhol did to the image of Prince may have been transformative. However, this was used for a commercial purpose in a way that erodes that transformative use, at least in terms of a fair use analysis. So that's another case that sort of went against fair use that generative AI firms are going to have to grapple with. Another case that we're gonna to have to be looking at, the generative AI firms are certainly aware of, was a decision coming out of Delaware. And this was a case that was brought by Thomson Reuters against a firm called Ross Intelligence. What Ross Intelligence was accused of doing was ingesting Westlaw headnotes and then using those for the same purpose, so, so sort of to compete with Westlaw. Now what the court found, and this was on summary judgment, was that this was not a transformative use. This was not a generative AI case, but it was an AI case. And the finding against the AI firm at the summary judgment stage potentially does have read through to these other cases. Now that case is on appeal, and we could see it unwound before some of these other cases against generative AI firms mature. However, as of now, that is still the precedent that courts are gonna have in the back of their minds as they're considering fair use defenses by generative AI firms. Given these decisions in the Warhol case and Ross Intelligence, the precedent right now, we think it's more unfavorable for some of these large language models who are offering products that may compete more with the original content owners. Well, now when we look at the dozens of lawsuits existing in the US, the LLMs we think who may currently be most at risk are firms like Stability AI and Perplexity. And the reason for that is the complaints against them really do raise the prospect of these LLMs offering outputs to compete with the original content owners. On the other side of the scale, we have somebody like Meta. Meta, we think, faces less risk as of now. And one of the reasons for that is Meta, the lawsuits against Meta only focus on inputs. Now, inputs relate to everything that the large language model was trained on. So this is everything that it, it was ingested during learning. So this is anything from books, scraping the internet, anything like that. And on inputs, the fair use factor, we think it's gonna be a slightly stronger transformative use argument than it will if the case also included outputs. Outputs are what sort of the generative AI output. So it's a user inputs something, gets something in return. This is looking at output. The meta case, again, only concerns inputs, and we think that's gonna be have a less of a market impact. Now, some courts could go either way on this, and, and if courts do find the inputs are infringing, those are the instances where you could see really eye-popping damages awards. Again, because statutory damages in the US can be as much as 150,000 per work infringed. So really, that's where you could, could get to billions, if not trillions of dollars in damages in some cases. On the output side, we believe it might be a higher risk um, in terms of getting a fair use defense because you might have this market effects factor weighing against you. However, damages should be much less because you're going to have to prove damages on every single work. So you're gonna have to show every output might infringe a protected work that was used in the training process. Now more in the middle, we, we see firms like Anthropic. Anthropic does face both inputs and outputs allegations of infringement. However, Anthropic and many other large firms have, have tried to tweak their software to really minimize the output in a way that does not infringe. Now, I think there's gonna be some, some back and forth over whether or not these software tweaks were effective, but this is where we see firms directing resources in the future to try to limit that output risk. Right now, we're waiting for decisions in, in, in cases against Meta and Anthropic. Both of these firms have argued for summary judgment on fair use, with respect to that input infringement. And these are in two different courts, but we might have decisions by the end of 2025 in terms of whether input training in these specific courts and in these specific cases was infringing or not, or whether fair use may protect these defendants.
We're going to have to wait longer to find out whether courts think that in generative AI outputs are infringing or if they also may receive fair use protection. Probably the most followed case at the current time is a lawsuit brought by the New York Times and later joined by other newspaper publishers. And this is a lawsuit against OpenAI and Microsoft. This is a case that definitely has inputs as well as outputs at issue. This case is, is slower going because we have all these different plaintiffs than the cases against Meta and Anthropic. So we might not find out on summary judgment until 2026, potentially late 2026. In the meantime, we're teeing up other potential legal issues that are gonna be kicked even farther down the road. One of those is whether or not the output of a generative AI system is itself eligible for copyright protection. Now in the US at least, we've had one decision on this and, and, and the court, and this is a federal appeals court, said that the specific image involved, and this was an image entirely generated by a generative AI system, it said that that image was not eligible to receive copyright protection. Now there's a few reasons for this. One of the primary reasons is that copyright is intended to protect human invention. It, it, it fosters creativity by providing an artist a limited monopoly on monetizing their output. Now, if you have a computer generating that, that's not really ticking the same boxes in terms of incentivizing the creation. Another reason is that the term of copyright protection is almost always tied to the lifetime of the artist. Again, that creates some hurdles if you're talking about a computer system, which does not have the measurable lifespan of a human. So here the court said no. However, it's key to note that in this case, the person just told the generative AI to make an image. So it provided no artistic input. It's gonna be a much closer question moving forward when there's a mixture of back and forth between the human and the generative AI system. And it's likely that I think a lot of enterprises are really gonna to want to know what level of protection this output has, the more and more that they be in leveraging generative AI systems. However, again, we're gonna to have to wait and see on this. It is possible that we might have to have legislative intervention in the US as well as in the EU to really find out whether or not generative AI outputs are gonna receive IP protection. Bloomberg Intelligence recently published a deep dive report on the AI risks facing generative AI industries. You can find much more analysis of the specific cases that are being litigated, the fair use defense, as well as the content licensing opportunities that are maturing for content owners as LLM firms look to hedge against the potential risk of copyright infringement. You can check out that report on the Bloomberg terminal and you can see a description of it below.